Welcome to Chief Video. Today we're looking at Economics A2 level, paper 32, October, November 2022. Alright, let's start. Okay, so this is the first question. It says, what is most likely to improve the allocative efficiency of a market? Okay, so allocative efficiency is basically when your price equals to marginal cost. Okay, so basically, um, you're producing at a point where it's both, um, it's, um, it's, it, when it says it's allocatively, allocative efficiency is basically when the resources are allocated to its maximum potential. So in order for that to happen, um, first of all, you need to have high competition. So when you have high competition, um, there'll be many people entering the market. When there are many people entering the market, there'll be competition. And when there's competition, this means that people, uh, all firms will try to try their best to actually um, produce goods at the lowest cost and also at the same time producing at a point where um, they're, they're not uh, wasting too many resources which could otherwise be used for a higher production of a particular good. Therefore, um, uh, entry of firms into the market would be important. So let's look at the four options here to see whether or not um, it relates to what I mentioned just now. A, it says a higher market concentration ratio, which is uh, incorrect. And then um, B, it says collusion between um, firms in the market. Uh, collusion between firms in the market would mean that um, they'll be operating like a, a cartel. And when they operate like a cartel, this means that um, they'll be operating at one specific price. And it makes it feel like it's a monopoly, but it isn't. it's just that every single firm is... Um, uh, is actually just producing that particular good at that particular price. Not only does it harm consumers, it also harms um, the entire market because of the price that they set. Um, yeah, so B is incorrect. C it says entry of new firms in the market, which will result in competition, which is correct. And D it says mergers of firm it's firms in the market. If you merge firms in the market, instead of having like something a perfect competition or more of a competition, you end up with something like a monopoly. Let's say, like. There used to be, let's say, 10 companies, for example. Let's say um, uh, 10 years later, only five companies are left because all five of these companies merge, merge with another company. And then let's say another 10 years later, these five companies become into one single company because this one company purchased the other four companies, merge together, and then end up in becoming a monopoly. So this would re reduce allocated efficiency because when you're a monopoly, you are basically the um, price setter. And when you're the price setter, you are basically... Um, um, not, you can choose to not allow the uh, consumers to purchase the goods at the optimal price. So D is incorrect. Answer is C. Question 2. The diagram shows a market in which there are negative externalities of production and positive externalities of consumption. So when there's negative externalities of production, this means that your MSC is more than your MTC, which is shown here. And positive externalities and consumption is when your MSB is more than your MPB, which is also shown here. Now, um, if you're producing at both of these points, you realize that um, it, it will always be down to the point where MPC equals to MPB because there's negative externalities of production. So so um, your MSC is more than MPC um, and your actual production point would be where the MPC curve touches the MPB curve. So we have to look at the point where MPC touches MPB, which is at point G. Okay, at point G, this is where um, the market will be producing because of the two externalities that are shown here. And then now the question asks, what is the marginal external cost at the free market equilibrium? So marginal external cost would be marginal social cost minus marginal private cost. So if you look here, the ways to get marginal uh, external cost would be to minus H, uh, we, we would get uh, from point H to point I. Or point from point F, a uh, point E to point G. So these two would be your marginal external costs. However, um, because point I is the equilibrium where the MPC touches the MSB, this is not where we are producing at the moment. We are producing at the point where MPC equals to MPB. So when you're producing at the point where MPC equals to MPB, this means that um, your marginal external cost would be from E to G. So the answer is A. Question three, what could be included in a cost benefit analysis of a project to build a road bridge connecting an island community to the mainland? Okay, so uh, originally there was no bridge. There's only, let's say, a, a, a ferry that brings people and cars back and forth. Okay, so 
um, you need to consider things such as if let's say you were to build a road bridge, what will happen? Of course, the cost would be a problem. Um, would it bring advantages? Yes, it will, because it actually shortens the travel time uh, to work. Let's say, for example, let's take uh, Malaysia, for example, the Penang Bridge and also the Penang Ferry Services. So if only originally we only had the Penang Ferry Services, uh, you need to wait maybe 15 to 30 minutes for a ferry. And then um, from, let's say, uh, the Penang Island to mainland would probably take at least 30 minutes. But if you, uh, let's say 30 to 40 minutes, depending on the, uh, depending on that day, also a uh, tight condition and all those. If let's say you were to build a bridge, uh, which, which spans uh, across 13.5 kilometers of land, uh, sorry, 13.5 kilometers of sea, um, that means that you'll be able to get from uh, mainland to island or island to mainland within uh, 20 minutes. So that actually cuts your time by at least uh, 50%. So yes, there is a reduction in travel time for work. So this is a, a consideration. So this has to be included. Therefore, A, B is incorrect. And then, but then the thing is, would it result in, because of the fact that there are more cars on the bridge, this would result in more carbon emissions because now instead of stopping a car on the ferry and allowing uh, the ferry to transport the vehicles and people to the other side of the, uh, let's say another side of the same from the island to the mainland, um, this would result in cars actually going from the island to the mainland, which means that the cars are operating and the cars would actually release uh, carbon monoxide. So yes, an increase in carbon emissions is actually an analysis here. So therefore, A and B is incorrect. And then we need to consider if let's say you were to build a road bridge, would it result in employment in the ferry services to decrease? And this is actually actually possible because first of all, when you... Um, when you decide to create a road bridge, you're actually reducing the employment available because now more people will be would prefer to just, you know, take the bridge. And then because of the fact that the bridge would be costly to produce, um, uh, the companies that build the bridge do build this bridge would end up just, you know, uh, asking motorists to pay for the tolls. And then the people who are working at these tolls will be the one benefiting and not the people at the ferry services because of the decrease in the usage of the ferry services to begin with. And second of all, um, uh, second of all is because um, into in relation with the first question, um, if let's say there's a decrease in users, there's, that means there's also a decrease in income. When there's a decrease in income, that means you do not require that many people to work in that particular area anymore. Therefore, it will result in a foreign employment, so D is incorrect. Lastly, um, by actually allowing the, uh, the uh, bridge to be built, you're actually allowing for an increase in income because people will now prefer to go to the other side to work instead of just staying, let's say, the island or let's say people from the mainland wants to go to the island, but it's a bit difficult because of the fact that you need to take a ferry now, there's a bridge, people will end up just take the bridge to go to work. And um, so this would definitely result in an increase in income. So, yep, so in this case, B is incorrect. So the final answer will be C with everything as in, with everything included in the cost benefit analysis. Question 4, the table shows the level of total and average utility at different levels of a consumer's weekly consumption of a product. And after which level of weekly consumption does the diminishing marginal utility first occur? Okay, let's take a look at the first week. The total utility is 4.0. Second week, the total utility is 9.0. Um, or just 9 in this case. It's around it all. So the difference between the second week and the first week will be 5. The third week is 15, which means that if you take 15 minus 9, you get 6. And then the fourth week is 20. If you take 20 minus 15, you get 5. Therefore, there's a decrease in the marginal utility. So after which level of weekly consumption does the diminishing marginal utility occur, which will be after the third week. So the answer for number 4 is A. Because after the third week, you can see that the marginal utility is only 5 instead of 6. Therefore, there's a decrease in the marginal utility. Question 5, which statement about a budget line in consumer behavior theory is correct. So a budget line is basically something like a PPC. Uh, a PPC is to show the maximum combination of tools that a that an economy can produce with given resources, but a budget line is basically the total amount, maximum combination of tools that a consumer can buy with his or her given income. So A, it says it illustrates consumer preferences between two goods. This is actually uh, less accurate, so um, A would rule that out. B, it says it illustrates combinations of tools that consumers are able to purchase with a given income which is correct because here it states combination of two goods and even income. So it's based on the income that you have at the moment. Let's say I only have a 1,000 ringgit. I can only produce like, purchase like maybe 50 for that good A and maybe 30 good B. And then yes, that's correct.
But before we um, conclude this, uh, this is the answer. Let's look at CNB. CSS illustrates the least cost combination of goods that yield the same level utility, which is incorrect. And then D, it illustrates the income effect of a price change. The income effect of a price change um, is not what the what the budget line is exactly used for in this case. Okay, we're talking about only one budget line, so uh, D is incorrect. So answer is B. Okay, so for question six, when the price of a good increases, which statement is correct according to the analysis that uses budget lines and indifference curves? Okay, let's look at the four options. A, it says the income and substitution effects of the price increase will work in opposite, opposite directions in the case of a given good. The reason why this is correct is because for given goods, um, even though given goods are basically um, in theory and nature, uh, people would end up just buying more of given goods uh, because uh, compared to inferior goods, um, given goods are goods that people have to survive on even though they're inferior, okay? Probably they bring these advantages, but at the same time, they actually bring advantages during emergency situations. B, the income effect of the price increase will result in reduced consumption for all goods, which is incorrect because um, just because there's one there's increase in one product doesn't mean that all the other uh, products would have a reduce in consumption. In theory, the other goods would have an increase in consumption because um, people will end up just buying more of uh, cheaper goods rather than buying the more expensive ones. C, the new attribute position will be where the new budget line meets the original indifference curve, which is incorrect. If there's a new budget line, there will be a new indifference curve. Therefore, it will not um, be the new attribute position if there's only one indifference curve from the original position. D, the price rise will be re represented by a parallel shift inwards of the original budget line, which is incorrect. The price rise is not represented by a parallel shift, it's represented by uh, um, a slightly um, slightly steeper uh, shift. So we can see that originally, let's say this is the budget line, and then originally maybe you can buy like maybe good X or good Y. But let's say there's a price rise of good X, for example. Then the price rise will become something like this. Initially, you could probably like purchase 300, now we can only purchase 200. Okay. Just because um, the price of good X increase doesn't mean that the price of good Y will increase as well. You could still purchase this particular amount of good Y if you want to, but at the moment, because of the price rise, price rise of good X, you can only end up purchasing either, uh, you can only purchase like 200 of good X and forego every single thing of good Y instead of 300. So therefore, D is incorrect. The answer is A. Question seven, the diagram shows a firm in an imperfectly competitive market and which level output would maximize total revenue. So you have to remember that this is total revenue. Okay, so when we want to maximize total revenue, let's look at um, the four options here. Um, of course, if you were to produce at point D, this is impossible <laughs> because it's output but price of zero. So D is incorrect. Now, if you, pro if you produce at a point equals to C, P equals to MC, um, so that means you're touching the marginal cost curve and the average revenue curve. Um, at this point, you are actually um, you are actually suffering a loss. So this is incorrect. And then um, point A and point B. Point A is where you where your MC touches your MR curve. When your MC touches the MR curve, this is profit maximization. But here we're talking about revenue. Profit is when your revenue is. Um, subtracted by costs and in this case revenue is just enough to sustain the cost that you have for operating in this particular market so A is also incorrect because of that so other third is B. Question E in the diagram shows short run average cost curves and the long run average cost curve for a firm uh, which statement is correct? So A it says when each of the, the three SRIC curves is in shape it shows the existence of economics of scale uh, this is not exactly correct, okay. B, when the LRAC curve is upward sloping beyond output or Q, it shows the existence of these economies of scale. Yes, this is correct. Now, U-shaped curve, um, from let's say point something to point something, let's say from here to here, yes, you can see that there is existence of economies of scale. But once you go off from that curve, you end up just purchasing, uh, producing more and more and more, you realize the cost increases, this part will be the diseconomies of scale. So yeah, that's why it is incorrect. And C, 
When the minimum point of SRAC2 is below that of SRAC1, it shows the existence of the law of variable proportions, which is incorrect. And D, when the minimum point of SRAC2 is below that of SRAC3, it shows the existence of economies of scale, which is, uh, which is incorrect. So in order to show the existence of these economies of scale, you will see that the LIAC curve is upwards slowing beyond output OQ. As you can see from this point, the cost increases. This is this economies of scale. From point close to zero all the way to point Q, this is economies of scale because there's a decrease in cost to point Q. So the answer for this one would have to be B. Question 9, the diagram shows a decrease in demand for the product of a profit maximizing monopolist. And which area shows the change in the monopoly supernormal profit as a consequence of this decrease in demand? Okay, so a decrease in demand would be um, originally is supposed to be, to be AR uh, is D1, but then it becomes D2, and MR1 becomes MR2. So originally, um, the entire supernormal profit should be somewhere at the point where P, uh, P, MC equals to MR. MC equals to MR would be this entire thing here. But after the decrease in demand, you realize that the curve shifts inwards, and when the curve shifts inwards, it becomes AR2. So when it becomes AR2, the only profit that they're earning is actually from JM to L to K. So that means that the change would be I, H, G, L, M, J, which is C. So answer is C. Question 10 in the table shows the estimated cost for operating a new factory at the end of its first year. And then assuming the short run is one year, what are the total variable costs? Okay. So building the factory is a fixed cost. Okay. Undeniable. So this is not the answer. Raw materials, including fuel, is a variable cost. So this is correct. And then machinery and delivery vehicles are fixed costs that you can't, uh, you know, you can't uh, avoid. So this is also a fixed cost. But wages for workers is a variable cost. It is a variable cost because um, if let's say, these workers are working part-time. Technically, when you hire them, you could reduce the salaries, you could increase the salaries, etc., etc., unless it's full-time workers. So in this case, your wages could be variable. So the answer is 6 million, which is B. Question 11. A manufacturing company merged with two companies. One of these was Company X that produced a substitute product. The other company was company Y that supplied its raw materials, and which combination shows the types of merger that the manufacturing company has undertaken? Okay, so this is a horizontal merger, and this is a vertical merger. I'm just going to represent, represent it with V and H. Okay, so uh, horizontal merger is basically when these two or three companies are involved in the same manufacturing process or in the same sector. So when you merge with them, that's called a horizontal process, a uh, horizontal um, merger. If it's a company merging with another company that is of a different manufacturing process, but you require that manufacturing process in order for your particular stage to continue with that particular product, then that's where they go merger. So here it says that company X produce a substitute product. It means that they're producing similar products, but it could be a replacement. So they are maybe competitors. So company X would have to be a horizontal merger. So C and D is wrong. And then uh, the other company supplied the raw material. So it supply more raw material means that it is a previous um, vertical mergers, so this one would be vertical mergers, so A is incorrect, so answer is B. Question 12, which phrase best describes the market structure illustrated by the diagram if the firm produces at output Q1? So you can see that um, MC touches AR, and the maximum point is at AC. Um, so this one would be would be a monopoly firm. So this case, right, um, anything that says super normal profits and only poly would be incorrect. And then monopolistic firm in a short run at equilibrium is incorrect because the monopolistic firm will want to make super normal profits, producing a point where uh, MC goes to MR. In this case, in this case no. Um, so you can see that um, uh, you can see that in this case, right, the MR can go downwards, and when the MR goes downwards, it means that it's negative. So your marginal revenue is actually negative. Uh, your AR is basically at this point, and then your AC is at this point. So you just um. So you're basically producing at a point where your average cost is higher than your average revenue. Um, so when you're producing at a point where your average cost is higher than your average revenue, you're basically making a loss. 
when you're making a loss, this is only possible if the government is providing subsidies to this government-linked company, right? So when you're producing, uh, for this, when you're when you're a uh, GLC or government like a public like a state company, you're producing only then you're able to, uh, produce at Q1 because in this case, right, it is a loss. Your average cost is higher than the average revenue, and this is clearly stated on this graph, right? So let's say P1 and P2. Your average revenue is P2, and your average cost is P1. Okay, so there's a huge difference and you're producing same quantity. So this has to be another prof profit maximizing statement of the so I'll say D. Okay, so for question 13, it says the government wants to regulate the consumption of a demerit good in order to increase society's net welfare. In which situation will society's net welfare increase? Okay, so A, it says the fall in the marginal social benefit is greater than the fall in the marginal social cost. Of course, this is incorrect because why, how, would society's net welfare increase when the MSP is less than your MS when, when the fall is higher than your MSC? B says the fall in the M, uh, marginal external cost is greater than the fall in the marginal external benefit. Now, uh, we are talking about marginal um social social uh, benefit. So um so in this case, right, the marginal external cost would be the cost that is owned by uh, other people, right? So um. So B is incorrect in that context. And C, the four in the total social benefit is greater than the four in the total social cost, which is incorrect. And D, um, the four in the total social cost is greater than the four in the total social benefit. So this is correct because when the four in the total social cost is greater than the four in the total social benefit, this means that your social benefit would, <clears throat> would not be as affected. So therefore, answer is D. Question 14, governments often aim to reduce income inequality. The diagram shows the effect of using taxation and benefits to try and achieve this aim. And what can you conclude from the diagram about the effects of taxes and benefits? So let's take a look at the household income. So the bottom 20 here, you can see that the original income is probably less than 10,000. Disposable income is around um, maybe 16,000. Then the final income is somewhere around 18,000. The second is some somewhere along those lines like with a slightly uh, increased uh, value. And then the third one would be, you can see that the disposable income is somewhat closer to the original income. And the final income is not as high as it should be. But when you reach the fourth 20% and top 20%, you um, realize that they have a dip in their original uh, from, of their disposable income and a dip in their final income. Uh, and the worst one will be up 20%. You can see the original income is more than 80,000, but the, the final income is somewhere around $62,000. So what can we conclude from the diagram about the effects of taxes and benefits? So A, it says all income groups are better off except those originally earning more than 40,000 per year. So um, that's correct because you can see that you can see all income groups are better off. So because you can see that those who are earning um, less than $40,000 and you realize that their final income would increase. But then if it's for the fourth 20% and the top 20%, their income's dipped. So A is correct because of that. And B, benefits paid to the lower income groups are not a burden because they are not paid out of tax revenues, which is incorrect because they are definitely paid out of tax revenues because the government will have no way to, put, to provide benefits to uh, consumers um, if they do not have the tax revenue. Therefore, they have to tax it out of the fourth 20% and the fifth 20%. And C, the average final income of the top 20% exceeds the combined final incomes of the other groups. Uh, so the average final income of the top 20%, which is this one, exceeds the combined final income. So this is 62,000. So let's take like, okay, now let's take this one and then we add this one. It's already more than 60,000. So definitely, uh, so this is incorrect. And D, the progressive taxation system still favors the top 20% over the bottom 20%, which is incorrect. Obviously you can see that here, the final income of the top 20% is definitely quite high, whereas for the bottom 20% it increased because of the fact that there are welfare benefits. So these incorrect so answers A. Question 15, which policy is likely to be the least effective means of producing a more equal distribution of income amongst households? Okay, so A, it says the imposition of minimum wage levels below the levels produced by the market. So, I mean, for this particular um, question, A is definitely out of the question. So it definitely would be the least effective means. B, the introduction of progressive personal income taxes. This is actually a way to provide more equal distribution of income because the higher your income, the higher your taxation. So B is correct in that context. So it's not the answer here. And C, the payment benefits to low-income households. Same goes for this one. 
and D, the removal of sales tax on the food consumer lower income health food, which is also the same, you're providing them with more money to purchase foods instead of, you know, paying for the sales tax. So this is A. Question 16, which supply curve indicates that eventually an individual will choose to spend more time on leisure life rather than continue working for increased wages. Okay. So A, you can see that the longer the hours work, the higher the wages. So this is not correct. B, you can see that regardless of how many hours the person works, the wage is still the same, but there's no dip in, um, there's no dip in the hours work or there's no dip in, wait, yeah, there's no dip in the hours work, but like, like I'm going back or something like this. So, uh, B is incorrect. As C, no matter, um, how many hours, uh, no, so no matter the wage, the person will still work for that particular hour, particular number of hours, so C is incorrect. And D, um, you can see that originally, let's say the hours work is three, and then the maximum point will be five and then drop back to three again. So if this is the case, that means that even though there's higher wages, um, people would rather just, you know, spend less hours work. Uh, because they would, you know, they would rather spend more time on leisure. So answer for this one is D. Question 17, when is a trick any less likely to gain a large pay rise for its workers? A, it says it represents a large portion of the workforce. If it represents a large proportion of the workforce in the company, then it is actually likely to gain a pay rise. So this is not the answer. B, it represents a workforce that has an elastic demand for labor. So yeah, this is the answer because if you have a lasting amount for labor, um, that means that you could choose not to hire these people and rather even you know, pay a lower salary because they don't really need that much labor. Unless it's inelastic demand, then this is possible to demand for higher wages. But in this case, it's not because of elastic demand. And C, it represents a workforce that is increasing as labor productivity. This rate would have would be possible for it to have a larger pay rise. And D, it represents a workforce that works for a highly profitable monopoly firm. Um, if it's a highly profitable monopoly from this, um, it's, it's likely for them to have a large pay rise, so this is incorrect, so answer is B. Question 18, which statement does not support the view that extraction of mineral resources by a foreign company will make it more difficult for a developing economy to achieve future economic growth? So look here, it says does not support the view, uh, make it more difficult for a developing economy to achieve future economic growth. So it's saying that the extraction of mineral resources will make it easier for the developing economy to achieve uh, future economic growth. So, um, so this means that it's not supporting a view that it will make it, uh, you, you support the view that it's making it easier for the developing economy to achieve future economic growth. So this sentence basically means that um, it is supporting that it is supporting that it makes it easier uh, for economic growth. So A, it says exports of these mineral resources will result in the appreciation of the exchange rate. When there's a appreciation of the exchange rate, this means that the products that they're exporting out of these countries will be more expensive. When it's more expensive, it will be less competitive. When it's less competitive, people will end up not buying it. When people don't buy it, you there will be a result in a decrease in the exports, which would actually result in your aggregate demand to decrease, so A is incorrect. And B, reduce tax rates aim at encouraging a foreign company to invest for increasing inflation, so this is making it difficult for economic growth. And C, the foreign company will raise the skill levels of the local population through training schemes, which would help the population to have skills, which is good for economic growth. And D, the foreign company will send profits back to its own country, which is not going to help the economic growth of the country, so answer is C. Question 19, growth rates can be calculated using changes in the value of GDP from year to year. And why is real GDP considered to be a better indicator than nominal GDP for this calculation? Nominal GDP is GDP not adjusted for inflation. Okay, it's not adjusted for inflation. So rather than looking at nominal GDP, we should look at real GDP. And let's take a look at the four options. Okay, A it says real GDP adjusts for price changes using a base layer. So this is correct. And B, real GDP ignores the effects of fluctuation in exchange rates on purchasing power, which is incorrect. It does um, care about the effects of fluctuation in exchange rate because, like I said, real GDP is GDP adjusted for inflation. And C, real GDP includes changes in the size of population. Um, this is not the answer. It's not accurate. And yeah. And D, real GDP measures GDP as factor cost rather than market prices, which is incorrect. So answer has to be A.
Question 20. Why is disaster relief money sent by non-governmental organizations to a South American country not classified as official foreign aid? When we talk about official foreign aid in the balance of payments, it has to come out of the pockets of the government. So let's take a look at the four options. A. It does not finance a long-term investment program, which is incorrect. B. It does not incur payment of interest, which is incorrect. C. It is not supplied by government. Uh, yep, this is the correct answer. And D. Only countries in Asia and Africa are classified as developing, which is incorrect. There are numerous countries in South America that are classified as developing as well. In fact, there are Asian countries that are already developed, including Singapore. So D is incorrect because of that. So answer is C. Question 21. What is the cause of seasonal unemployment? Seasonal un unemployment is basically when uh, this person is um, not working because of the fact that for this particular season, he or she cannot earn this amount of money because of the fact that people are no longer needing these items. For example, let's say in winter, you can sell maybe um, you know, warm jackets and all those, but then in summer, people would prefer to wear you know, lighter clothes and that would result in seasonal unemployment as an example. So A, it says a general decrease in demand for goods and services. This one is cyclical unemployment. So nope. cyclical unemployment is basically unemployment caused by economic recession or also known as a decrease in aggregate demand. And B, a lack of necessary skills in the workforce. This is structural unemployment because structural unemployment is when uh, there is a change in technological processes and then causing a lot of people who are unskilled to be left out of the economy, left out of the employment because they do not have the necessary skills to keep on with the production. So B is incorrect. And C, a temporary change in the pattern of consumers' expenditure, which is correct. And D, an unwillingness of workers to move to other parts of the country where there is work. This is frictional unemployment, so these are correct. So answer is C. Question 22. A firm initially employs 50 workers, each working 40 hours a week, and produces a total output of 18,000 units. It then employs an additional 10 workers, again, each working 40 hours, and total output rises to 19,200 uh, 19, units. And which effect does this rise in employment have on labor productivity per hour? Okay, so to calculate this, um, we take 18,000, we divide by 40. When we divide by 40, we will get something like... This, which is 450. And then we take 450, we divide by 50. When we do that, we get 9. Okay. So per worker, you're getting 9 units. Let's let's take a look at the additional 10 workers. Let's just add it together. So 60, uh, let's just take 19, 200 divided by 40 again. So something like this. And then divide by 8, 320, um, 0, 0. So 480, we divided by 60. So you get 8. So you can see from 9 units, become it becomes 8 units. So there's a decrease by 1 unit. So answer is A. Question 23. According to Keynesian theory, when we would increase in the money supply and leave the level output unchanged? Okay, so specifically Keynesian theory, and well, when we would increase in money supply and leave the level output unchanged? A, it says when there's a liquidity trap, which is correct. Because even though there is... Uh, because even though like you know the interest rates are already very low, so even though there's an increase in level, uh, increase in money supply, uh, and then the fact that the interest rates are already very low, um, people would rather, you know, rather, um, rather hold hold the money regardless of uh, rather than using it for anything else. So, the level output will unchanged because of that, and B it says when the money supply increase was not anticipated, which is incorrect, and C when there's a floating exchange rate. Which is incorrect. There's a floating exchange rate. An increase in money supply would actually um would actually help to increase the level of output. And D, when there's an immediate adjustment to expectation about future price level, which is also incorrect. So answer is A. Question twenty four. An economy is experiencing a negative output gap. And what is most likely to happen to the inflation rate and unemployment in this economy? Okay. Negative output gap, which means that there is a um, a deflation wood gap, meaning that your uh, meaning that your uh, this means that your uh, potential growth is higher than your actual growth. Okay, so your inflation rate will decrease because this is deflation in graph. So C and D is wrong, and then um, your unemployment would actually in would actually increase because less people purchasing, meaning that um, there's 
you know, aggregate supply is higher, your potential growth is higher than your actual growth. So your aggregate demand is low. When your aggregate demand is low, um, it means that demand for that, for these particular products is low and then people would, you know, be, people will be out of jobs because of the decrease in the pure GDP. So I'll say it's B. 25. What do monetarists believe? So let's look at the four options. A, it says economies are naturally unstable. No, this is not what they believe in. B, policymakers should follow set rules targeting in monetary supply. Yes, this is the answer. And C, the aggregate supply curve has a slight slope. It's not a slight slope. Okay. Uh, the AS curve could be something like this. And in the long run, it's a steep curve. So it's not a slight slope. And D, wage movements are sticky downwards, which is incorrect. Monetarists believe that policymakers should follow set rules targeting the money supply, so on says B. 26. Which combination of changes over time in the economy would definitely represent increased economic growth per capita? Okay, the combination of changes over time in the economy would definitely represent increased economic growth. Um, average price level would have to decrease, um, so CND is wrong. Total output would have to rise. Uh, total population should, in this case, fall. And the Gini coefficient should uh, should rise if your Gini coefficient uh, rises. This would represent increased economic growth. Um, because if your Gini coefficient rises, Because when your Gini coefficient rises, this means that there's higher income inequality. When there's higher income inequality, um, um, you can see that people who work and people who don't really work as much, the the diff the, the the income gap between them would actually be higher, which is actually a problem with economic growth. But it's it's a sad truth. But it's possible it's possible as well. So that's why the answer is A. 27. Under which circumstances will the future burden of the national debt on the country increase the most? Uh, future burden of the national debt. So, increase in the budget deficit should be high. So, A and B is wrong. Price of government bonds will have to decrease. So, D is wrong. So, answer is C. There's only a very little change in GDP, but there's a very huge increase in budget deficit, and the bonds of the government is decreasing. So, when the government bonds decrease, um, uh, there will be high interest. When there's high interest, the government will have to pay a high interest to people buying the bonds, which will result in higher burden. Okay. And then 28, country X has a low rate of inflation in a stable currency and unemployed resources. It attracts $25 billion of direct foreign investment. But it's most likely to be a positive benefit of the inflow of this FDI for country X. So low rate of inflation, stable currency, unemployed resources. So, uh... Let's look at the four options. Um, so A, aggregate demand will be boosted. Yes, this is correct. Through the investment multiplier, there is FDI. B, country X will have to use its foreign reserves to eliminate any trade deficit, which is incorrect. Why would they have to eliminate any trade deficit when there's an investment coming in? And C, the balance of payments will be affected with the outflow of profits to foreigners, which is incorrect. Money coming in as FDI means that the foreign money is coming into our, our country, not the fact that profits are outflowing. And D, the rate inflation will increase if country X tries to increase capacity, which is incorrect. So answer is A. This will be a negative benefit and A will be a positive benefit. Question 29, a country with an income tax rate, uh, X decides to increase the tax rate. This one will be your Laffer curve. Your Laffer curve would then indicate that people who would rather, um, would rather work less because they do not want to they have lesser incentive about because of the high tax revenue. So it's not asking why will this happen and not what are the consequences. So A, it says fewer goods will be produced. Um, this is the consequence. And B, people will work fewer hours to maintain income. So um, this is a consequence. And C, price will rise, which is a consequence. And D, there will be an increase in tax avoidance. People want to avoid paying tax. When people avoid paying tax, they will actually, um, they will actually try and um, they will try to like, uh, work lesser to avoid the higher taxes because they already have a disincentive to work to begin with. So answer is D. 
And question 30, what are the labels on the axis of a Phillips curve diagram? So the axis of a Phillips curve diagram, the vertical axis would be your inflation rate and your horizontal axis would be your unemployment rate. So answer is B. Okay, so this is the end of this paper. I hope you uh, guys find this video helpful. Do share this video out to other people who may need help with A2 economics. Till then, this is the video. Goodbye.